I owe as well. Oh yeah. Morning. Good morning. Okay, so put my camera on. We have a recording going. Um, and what we do? Sorry. A cup of tea from uh, Brad. No, not this morning. Not this morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I take it, it's cold there. Um, my garage can get a bit cold. I've got a wee heater on the background, but it's uh, it's better just to be nice and warm. So I like, I like feeling cosy in here. But um, I put a radiator in, but it's not enough to fill the two. It's a double sided garage, so it, mm. I need to I need to plaster up the wall on that side. But it's still a bit nippy in here. Yeah, comfort's better than style. You're quite right. Right, yes. definitely. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, I wanted to continue on what I was doing from last week. And last week, of course, was uh, we'd moved on to risk. And weirdly, this morning, I had a risk issue. Because what I'd been doing when we'd started working from home is I'd done a wee risk analysis of what could go wrong with all this kind of stuff. And one of the things that occurred to me was I might not have anything. So I better down, oops. I might not have anything, so I better download all the presentations. And all the materials that I would need. Because clearly there was a, a risk that I might not be able to get access, that I might not have anything to present to you. Yes, I mean, was trying to um, get onto um, my WS, and um, yeah, it's not playing ball. Correct. And that was my fear that, that we didn't have access to Moodle, that we didn't have access to the materials. So I thought I would have things all set and ready to go. So I had the risk analysis, I had the possible consequences that I couldn't do the lecture, and I had some mitigation in place, which was that I downloaded it. But actually I then rethought my risk analysis and I stopped doing this. Anybody want to guess why I stopped? What was my reassessment? Um, so you were downloading them just to your personal PC and then you changed your mind? Yep. Uh, I don't know, probably having more copies than necessary could have been a risk if it was like a serious document. I don't that know actually is a risk. Oh. It wasn't worried of one I was worried about in this case because I was keeping it in a particular place that I knew was only for this. But you're right, having one set of data that you know is correct is definitely an issue and one that should be addressed. No, it was a different reason that I stopped doing it. Maybe legal issue of the, the policy of the unit. Is that? Uh, again, something that has to be taken into account. In this case, of course, they're all my materials. So I wrote them, they're all copyright to me, so I own them. Uh, so no, that's not an issue in this case. Maybe okay. you were not you were downloading them on your um, um, on your um, drive, not on the local machine, on your network drive, not on the local machine. And then you stopped and thinking, hmm, if I can't access model, then I might not be able to access my access my network drive, so I should download them onto my local machine. That was exactly the thought process, and it wasn't about saving them onto a network drive. It was the idea that, well, if I've downloaded these files, and the reason I'm downloading them is I can't access the network, then presumably all of my um, systems will be down. Mm. So I thought if one's down, all down. 
Yep. So I thought, well, there's no point in me having a local copy if I can't actually get access to a network to give this lecture. Because all I've got is local materials and I can't talk to you guys. Yeah. So I redid my risk assessment and I stopped doing it. On the basis that there was no reason to put in place the mitigation because there was no. There was no out path that wouldn't ever work. So what's caused me to re reevaluate my risk assessment? Or the fact that the site has been done. But we are still talking. It's continuous process. Clearly that thing there was wrong. So Moodle's down. And that's where the materials are. But because we do this on Teams, which is hosted on Microsoft servers, Microsoft is up. I made the wrong assumption. I was thinking of it in terms of, you know, maybe my network being down, uh, me not getting access to the internet, my router dying, whatever. But my assumption was wrong because some systems are down, but some are still up. So we can do this lecture, but I haven't downloaded all the materials for this lecture because Moodle's down and I had assumed that if Moodle was down, I would lose everything. So now I am going to revisit my risk register and I'm going to update it. In the, in the light of this new information, I need to change what I'm doing. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Yes. So this is a, yes. I mean, this is an incredibly small thing. But you can see how that whole idea of evaluating risks, understanding risks, putting plans in place to mitigate the risk or remove the risk isn't just a static thing. They always have to be revisited and they always have to be checked to ensure that what you're doing is right. So here's what we're doing today. As it happens, I had actually downloaded some of the stuff we'll need. So there is a lecture today. What I hadn't downloaded are all the supporting materials. So all those things on Moodle that have risk registers and all the PDFs, I don't have them just now. So you'll just have to remember them from last week and, um, and, and mentally use them. Um, I also need to apologize. I have been trying to phone somebody literally since Monday morning. I am told that they will phone me back but then I've been told that since Monday afternoon um, and I really do have to speak to this person. So for once I have left my phone on and I apologise in advance if it goes off, I will have to answer it. So apologies in advance if that if that happens. Um, but given that they haven't phoned me since Monday, it's a fairly low item on my risk register. It's a one by one on the grid. OK, so last week we talked about risk management. We talked about the idea of everyone taking risks. We talked about the idea of <coughs> risk being things that are uncertain. Well, of course, they're uncertain. If they were certain, there wouldn't be a risk. We would know what was going to happen. I don't know if I explicitly talked about some of the 
organisations out there that address this. So does anyone know when I've got their ISO 31000? Anyone know what ISO is? Is a standard, but uh, quality something like that. Risk management standard by the, what do you call it? The international standards people. I can't remember the name of them. Organization. Organization. The international standards organization. That's it. And you can see from the, the fact that we're up at 31,000 that they've got standards for all sorts of things. And this is a standard for risk management. And you'll see this pop up all the time. Because if you can prove that you've complied with, with ISO 31000, then people are likely to go, OK, you're taking this seriously. So it's something you'll see appear again and again. And there are links to it in Moodle, I promise you, but um, you'll have to take my word for it. So part of ISO uh, 31000 is talking about risk, what that actually means. And it just means if we don't know something, it might have an effect. But it doesn't mean we can't identify and manage the risks. And we talked about that um, in terms of things that we, we come across every day. So we talked about road traffic accidents, the idea that we don't stop traveling on the road. Instead, we put uh, things in place to um, address the issue. And we talked about the idea that we can accept risks, avoid risks, transfer risks, mitigate risks, and exploit risks. So moving on from that, Let's talk about the types of risk that we have. So as I say, we, we know about things like, um, we know about certain risks. We know that they exist. Some of them are very clear in, the, in our day-to-day -day lives. Some of them are less clear, which is why we actually take some time to sit back and reflect and think about our organisation, on what it does, about the people in it, about the processes that are around it, and essentially what could go wrong. We need to identify those risks and manage them. So how do we do that? Um, we need a, a way of doing it, a, an approach. And again, I've said this before in some of the other things, you'll see different approaches, you'll see different uh, recommendations, you'll see different options. They all, in essence, boil down to this. So this is an approach, but it's not the approach. So not surprisingly, the first thing you have to do for any sort of risk management is figure out what the threat is. So you identify it. And if you think back to the documents that we had, that's basically saying, what is the threat? What's the name of this threat? Then you have to start assessing that threat. So we need to look at particular things in our organization and figure out how vulnerable they are to this threat. We talked last week in great length about not performing maintenance on our vehicles. And, you know, at first look, you think, well, not performing maintenance is a fairly low risk. What could, I mean, it's not good, but what could go wrong? But of course, the idea that we don't um, perform maintenance on our vehicles leads on to the idea that we can't deliver our goods which leads on to the idea that our customers are not happy with us, which leads on to they won't order from us, which leads on to our business folds. So identifying it is one thing, 
trying to understand the context is another. Clearly our customer goodwill is a critical asset to our organisation. If customers don't like us, they won't come back. And there's not, you don't automatically think timing belt on a van to customer confidence. But actually, when you start to examine it and start to think about it, the link becomes clear. So you have to look at the risks and you have to understand the context they're in and you have to understand the knock on processes. But we also have to understand how likely those risks are before we can start to think about what sort of effort and what sort of resource we'll put in to addressing the risk, mitigating and all the other things that we talked about last week. So we have to understand how likely it is. Um, yesterday, the terror threat in the UK was increased from severe to imminent or whatever the words are. It went up. There is a risk in the UK from terrorism. I did not run out and fill sandbags and blast proof my front door because while that may have happened, the chances of me being a specific threat, uh, me specifically being at risk, are, I have assessed, vanishingly small. So there are different issues, and you have to decide um, how likely something is and what would happen. And that's a bit of a balancing act. It may be very likely, but not cost much. I may lose my pen. Well, I do that all the time. And it costs me 20 pence. So I don't really care that much. I might lose my laptop. Well, actually, I might lose my phone, which I have done. That was expensive. And I've learned not to put my phone in a pocket where it can slide out. So you have to understand how likely something is and how expensive it will be to fix it afterwards. Once you've done that, you can start to think about how you're going to reduce the risks. I don't care where I put my pen, I do care where I put my phone and decide which ones are most important for you, for your organisation. What are the key ones? So it's basically going through it in that order, trying to understand what the issues are, what might or might not happen, and sorting out what to do about it. So just like in a road traffic accident, we can identify the risk. We can figure out how to address it. We can avoid it, we can educate. So exactly as we spoke about last week. If you're an organisation though, there are different types of risk. So again, same caveat. There are other types of risks. Other people might give you a different list, which will include these, but add more. Other people might give you a different list, which excludes some of these. This is a reasonable approach. It is not the only approach. Oh, look at that. Moodle just come back up. So these are reasonable things to look at. Strategic, compliance, operational, financial and reputational are reasonable things to look at, but there could be others. This is not a, a definitive list. It is not the list. It is a list. OK, so it's something we are going to look at, but you'll see other things as you research this and you might come up with other things that don't belong under any of those categories. But we'll have a look at these and give you an idea of what might appear 
and some of these. So, for example, if we take a strategic risk, what are the strategic issues with your organisation? Because you can make a plan and it can just go tomorrow. Anything can change. And the things that can affect that change are both internal and external. So you can, for example, have internal issues. I once worked in an organisation where I was pushing for more staff training. And the guy that was running the organisation said, well, what happens if we train all these staff and then they decide to leave? My answer was very simple. What happens if we don't train them and they decide to stay? And you get a whole bunch of people who don't know what they're doing. Turnover can be an issue in terms of staff. And non-turnover can be an issue if the wrong kinds of staff don't go. Some people actually make, go to great lengths to call their staff they will give you a, an evaluation every year. And literally, if you're in the bottom 25%, they'll give you your books and you'll be out of the organisation. It's not a particularly helpful approach, I don't think, but it's this taken to its extreme. If you're not at least performing adequately, why do we keep you in the organisation? The idea is to make people work and make people work to try and strive to be the best which is a, a decent enough goal but when you have all of these people all trying to um, strive not everybody can be in the top 25 percent not everybody can be in the middle bonnie you stuck up your hand yeah, it's about the new situation, about the COVID. We must get inside this now in the external and internal strategic risk. Say that again, sorry? Say it's about, hello, it's about the COVID. I say you can get inside the strategic risk and try to mitigate it too. So there'll be plans in there to mitigate and all organisations have done that um, to a better or worse degree. Other organisations might fail to adapt themselves. They might be happy doing what they're doing. They might just think, yeah, that's fine. I'm making all this money. I'll have, I'll just continue doing that. But there might be other things externally that change that. Technologies can change. You might be very happily be um, Ford building big trucks and petrol and diesel cars. And all of a sudden technology changes and Tesla turn up with electric cars and everybody goes, oh, aren't they lovely? Helped, of course, by legislation to decrease emissions. So if you don't keep an eye on that legislation, things can happen and things can come out of the blue that you weren't expecting. You can be happily selling um, even small things. I don't know if you saw it, but last week, William Shatner, you know who William Shatner is? Yep. William Shatner waded into the Brexit issue. Why? Because he sells things. He sells pictures and autographs and stuff. He's got his own wee online shop that Star Trek fans go to. And from now on, if you're in the UK, you can't buy anything from his shop because the new Brexit regulations mean that everybody who sells into the UK has to sign up for the same um, 
set of regulations and have certain processes in place, and that costs them a minimum £1,000 a year. So if you're a small shop like Captain Kirk's is, all of a sudden that then becomes not worth it. If you're only selling £5,000 worth of stuff into the UK, but you've got to spend £1,000 to keep that going, you just walk away. The strategic risk isn't there. You could invest a thousand pounds and hope to increase his sales to say twenty thousand pounds, where the payback becomes worth it. But it's unlikely. Strategic issues can be an issue both internal and external. Kodak, for example, do people nowadays even know who Kodak are? Have you heard of Kodak? Some of my students haven't. They've got no idea who Kodak is. Do you guys know who Kodak? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Kodak made cameras. But more importantly, what Kodak did was they made paper for your prints and they made film so you could take your pictures and they made chemicals so you could develop your film and print it on the pictures. And they made the machines that did all that and they had a stream of shops where you could go in with your film and get it developed and a week later you'd get some prints. And they loved that model. They didn't make much from selling the cameras, but they made a fortune from all of these people coming back to buy film and paper and chemicals and all the rest of the stuff. So much so that when something comes along that might threaten that, they decide that they're not interested. Most people these days do not have film cameras. Most people these days have digital cameras. Most of them have digital cameras on their phone, maybe an Apple camera or a Samsung camera, still a digital camera. Do you know who invented the digital camera? Uh, no. no. You want to see a picture of the first digital camera? I've still got my first digital camera. It's like an 18 year old Olympus camera. I've got one of those. I had an old Apple one that had 300K. Oof. Well, here is the actual very first digital camera. At least it would be if my computer would actually. There we go. There you go. Here's the first digital camera. Wasn't what you would call portable. Wasn't even what you would call pretty. <laughs> but it was basically a lens from a camera in a box. You know what this is stuck to the side? I know, but my, do I think my brain would? I wonder mm. how the pictures came out look like. The prints. <laughs> oh, there was no prints. So you took the picture. There was a whole bunch of electronics underneath that grabbed the picture and then saved it onto a cassette tape that was bolted onto the side here. OK. And that was the first digital camera made by Kodak in 1975. And they demonstrated it and said, you know, we could we could lead the market. We could this is going to be the new thing, I promise you. But if you get a digital camera, you don't need all that film and paper and chemicals and all the rest of the stuff that they sold. So they ignored it. They just said, Well, good for you. Nice to see you trying new things. What's next? And of course, once things like this are invented, they can't be uninvented. And if you don't run with them, someone else will. If you are um, Waterstones or Borders booksellers or your Tower Records or Virgin Megastores and you're selling books and CDs, and you don't notice that somebody started to do that online. 
and you don't start to notice it. You can go online and get any book that you want or any CD that you want, and it'll be in your door in two days. Then someone else will. And this is what happened with Kodak. They ignored it. They thought, no, I'm happy with my business as it is. And they got killed. They went bankrupt in 2012. The business had gone. And by the time they figured out the business was going, it was too late to get it back. And of course, this picture, as I've said there, the picture of this first digital camera made by Kodak was taken on a Nikon camera. Sometimes you have to cannibalize your own business in order to move on and make more strategic gains later. If Tower Records way back when <clears throat> had decided, well, OK, I know I've got all these stores. But we're going to start doing mail order. They might still be around because people knew who Tower Records were. Why would you go to this funny wee thing called Amazon that you've never heard of if Tower Records were there? But Tower Records didn't, and Waterstones didn't, and Borders didn't, and HMV didn't, and Virgin didn't, but Amazon did. And now you can see for yourself how big Amazon are. You all know that. Jeff Bezos isn't just the most, isn't just the richest person in the world. He's the richest person that has ever been. He got divorced and gave half of his money to his ex-wife. And they immediately both went into the top five of richest people in the world. Sometimes you just have to move on, understand what's happening, rather than just hoping that what you have will continue. There'll still be a place for a, a corner store where you can go in and buy some milk and bread. But do you actually like going to Tesco's or Asda or Morrison's and stocking up on tins of baked beans or packets of pasta? Wouldn't it be nice just to go on and click the button and have somebody drop it off? It's already happening. It's not going to go back. Which is why they're trying to turn now. And it's why Amazon are trying to get into that kind of uh, business as well. So you can buy that kind of stuff from Amazon too. Not only can I go onto Amazon and have toilet roll with me first thing tomorrow morning, depending on the area of the country that I live, I can have it delivered within two hours. In the same way as we can have food delivered within two hours or one hour or 30 minutes. Things are changing. And if you don't have an idea about your strategy and where you're going, you might just get left behind. And part of the thing that changes is our third initial in GRC, compliance. Is your organisation compliant just now? Will it be compliant soon? Will it be compliant next year? What if you get bigger? What if you get smaller? What if you want to sell things to the EU? Last year it was fine. You just advertised. And as long as people were happy to pay the shipping costs, you sent it to the EU. But you've started to see all these adverts appear. If you're selling to the EU, there's a whole bunch of new forms that you have to fill in. A whole bunch of red tape that you have to get through. Fine, we'll stop selling to the EU. We'll sell to New Zealand. Well, great. Congratulations, your business where you sell canvas prints 
I'm sure that the change from selling to the EU and selling to New Zealand instead will replace all that. Is the stuff that you sell legal? Will it continue to be legal? If America want to sell us chickens, are they legal here? Well, no, because at the moment they're pumped full of steroids and washed with chlorine to make sure that they don't have uh, things like uh, legionnaires. And for some crazy reason, we decided that we didn't want those kinds of foodstuffs. But come January the 1st, apparently we've decided we do. And what about all the accounting rules? What about all the money that has to be assigned? Are we still paying VAT? Does VAT still exist when that was a, an EU thing? Do we change the VAT? Are there going to be different VAT levels? Which VAT level do you come under? What if it's not chicken? What if it's a different meat? What if you sell pork? What are the regulations for that? What if you try and replace all these things with selling it all, all online? Are you compliant with GDPR rules to ensure that all the customer information is all kept properly and you're not infringing on GDPR regulations? Hang on, GDPR is EU. What if the GDPR regulations change when we leave the EU? And I know they've said that they won't change them, but what if they do? Because, you know, the lion sods. What's going to happen? So you need to have an idea of what the current legislative framework is and have a good idea of what it might be. Because if you're blindsided and you suddenly can't sell things, you are stuffed. If you're selling things online and don't become GDPR compliant, you can't do that. In fact, there's been plenty of organisations where that's happened. Just last year, um, there was a big organisation that wasn't GDPR compliant. Do you know it kept five million pieces of data to, to actually create biometric IDs? completely against the law. They just took them. If you phoned up this organization and went on to their automated voice line, they would record everything. They wouldn't tell you the recording. They wouldn't ask you for your permission. They would just record it and they would, rec excuse me, they would record your voice print to try and create biometric IDs so that the next time you phoned they knew who you were. Any idea who that was? No. Didn't see it? I didn't, no. It was a little known organisation called Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. It was a tax man. It was the government. The government was actually breaking its own GDPR rules. And it took the information commissioner to force them to get rid of that information. So even for a large organisation that has a lot of resources, even for an organisation that's actually setting the rules, sometimes they're not in compliance with their own rules. Nobody's saying very much. Nobody, any questions or comments or anything? Uh, to be fair, well, about that, I'm not really surprised. And probably find that most people wouldn't bat an eyelid to finding that out. What on the basis that government is incompetent, kind of thing? Uh, that's, I don't even know if that's incompetent, that's just outright corrupt and uh, wrong. Do you know what I mean? So, um, uh, aye, they're all, I don't know. That, I can't believe that they're as incompetent as they appear. I believe incompetence is the kind of smokescreen for what they're actually trying to do. Maybe. 
Although, um, given the, the general number of things that you can point to in terms of incompetence, it's hard to believe that there is actually a veneer of competence hiding behind that. Anyway, so we've got strategic, we've got legislative, we also have operational. What about what we're doing internally? What if we have problems with our own people, our own processes? I mentioned last week about North Ayrshire Council, whose risk register we were looking at and who had been defrauded because someone had phoned up. They'd said, we are company X, here are our new details. It's now this bank with this sort code and this account number. Would you please change it? And the person at the end of the phone went, yep, no problem. So every payment that went to that company from then on was sent to this fraudulent company. There can be many places where that can work. So this person had authority to change payments. What if you get the authority to pay from the organisation? Back in the day, it was um, writing a cheque. Who got to sign the cheques? It's not as many cheques about these days, but what if you have access to the company bank account? What if there's only one person that just goes in and says, yep, yeah, transfer this here, transfer that there? What if it's not just transferring money? What if it's about awarding um, contracts? What if it's about awarding the brand new uh, hand sanitizer contract? How about we get somebody to give us our hand sanitizer? And the person makes a decision and does that. And just by coincidence, they award it to a company run by their brother. And nobody knows, nobody cares. What if the brother actually is, as it happens, does sell hand sanitizer. Well, maybe they could actually get the hand sanitizer. Maybe they could get £5,000 worth of hand sanitizer, but pay £10,000. And that extra five grand that someone who has authority to sign off on, well, let's just split that between us. Nice wee profit for us straight from the the company. I'm sure if you sat down, you could start to think of lots of places where that might happen. But as we're talking about government, let's talk about hand sanitizer and masks and gowns. Just in the last six months, Westminster have given out dozens of contracts worth tens of billions, and that's with a B, billions of pounds, to organisations that have no chance of actually fulfilling their contracts. I don't know if you know, you can um, you can basically pay a, a fee to set up a company. It costs you like 100 quid to become a company. So you fill your documents at company's house and you become a company. There are companies who have just been created who um, have been given contracts to procure PPE during this crisis. And they've been given them because they've been set up by 
friends of cabinet ministers or people that they've worked with before. <clears throat> and no one else gets a chance to apply for these contracts. No one else gets a chance to get that work. It's not about whether you can do a good job. It's whether you know somebody. And if you're in a company where you know a cabinet minister, they might just give you a contract without actually putting it out to tender and without caring really whether they're getting good value for our money. How about if you run a pest control company called Pest Fit? Turns out that a small company, net assets there, £18,000, were awarded a government contract for £32 million to supply gowns, surgical gowns. It, it didn't manufacture gowns, it didn't have an existing business where it supplied hospitals. It was given this contract basically as an intermediary. I'll give you money, you go away and order hospital gowns from China. I'm not sure why we couldn't just order our own gowns from China. I'm not sure why the markup had to be double the price of what the gowns were actually worth. <coughs> and if you actually are a company that can do that, why weren't you given the chance to apply for the work? An employment agency, and remember, these are companies, so you can see their accounts, their public accounts, so we know that the, the agency had £623, that's its complete net assets. They got £18, millions, 18 million pounds from the government to supply face masks. If before you sold sweets, how about a £100 million contract for PPE? £250 million going to Mauritius, to a company that does currency trading, offshore property and private equity, all of a sudden get a quarter of a billion pounds to supply medical equipment. I can go on and on. You feel free to read it yourself. That's an operational risk. We've got people who are awarding contracts on their say so, and we have no idea whether they are a good contract. So you can have issues with people, you can have issues with technology to drag this back to our field. What happens if your server goes down? What are the consequences? Are they proportional to the time it's down or does it become exponentially worse with the time it's down? What happens if there's a power cut? What happens if nobody in UWS can access the UWS website or Moodle? So you have to understand what might happen and what the possible outcomes are and put plans in place. And every single one of you can think back and think of times when you've went to log on to Google Mail and found out that it was down. Or if you're daft and you have a Facebook account, you've gone to log on to Facebook and it's been down. If I do a quick Google search for something like that. The 
and do a quick Google search, and of course I can't find one. So there you go, in August, Google Drive, Google Meet and Google Docs were down. Google Mail was down. For the whole world. Clearly not a good advert for Google. A month ago, Outlook was down. I couldn't access my university email because it's the same servers. And you wouldn't have been able to access yours either. eBay down, BT down. These things can be a massive hit for your organization. And you need to understand what could happen and why and what you're going to do about it. And you're back to thinking what it is um, that you put in place and how much you want to pay. If your server goes down, it's clearly an issue. How much do you want to pay to have it back up quickly? Enough to have a server sitting next to it that you can immediately jump to. Enough to have somebody on call who will bring a new server within two hours. Enough to have uh, a contract where somebody will come out and look at it within a day. All of these things are functions of what your possible downside is versus how much you want to pay to address that. And it happens to pretty much every company you can think of. Google, Amazon, eBay, Microsoft, you don't get much bigger and yet they've all had outages. It happens to all of us. The question is what you do about it. There can also be financial risk. Um, every organization is money in and out to a greater or lesser extent. It doesn't matter if you're a charity or a social enterprise or a business, there'll be money. You have to pay your rates no matter what, you have to pay your electricity bill. And it might be money that you get in from somebody buying something or it might be a donation but there's money in and out. Sometimes you'll bring in more than you spend and sometimes you'll spend more than you bring in. Clearly the latter isn't sustainable in the long term and in fact if you start um, spending more money than you bring in then the company will fold, the organisation will fold, your charity will fold, whatever it happens to be, you still have to cover your costs. That's why a lot of charities are, are worried. A lot of their income comes from shops on the high street. And if people are in lockdown, all of a sudden they've lost access to half of their income or whatever the percentage happens to be. There are other things that can happen. Um, interest rates can change. You might have a loan, you might have taken out a loan to build yourself a new warehouse, buy a couple of vans and start to expand your business. And all of a sudden the interest rates on your loan go up, but your income hasn't gone up because your business hasn't progressed as you would like it to. What if you're spending, what if you're doing a lot of things abroad? What if you're sending things abroad or getting things from abroad and the exchange rate changes? Did you lock in the price that you bought things for? Or did you buy something and promise to pay depending on what the actual exchange, exchange rate is? You may even have had that experience when you've gone on holiday. You've, I don't know, you've booked a holiday in Florida and then between you booking it and getting $2 for your pound and getting there, you might only get 
a dollar fifty for a pound. So all of a sudden the cost of your holiday has increased by 25 percent. There's nothing you can do about it. You might actually have sold things, but the people that you've sold them to haven't paid you yet. Every single organization has a has a, a debt chaser. People who will phone up and send letters and say, give me some money. In fact, it's so common that there are organizations that that's the whole job. Um, or what if you sell things and someone decides not to buy from you anymore? Because your delivery van broke down that day and they don't trust you anymore. Or because your product isn't what they want or it's at a wrong price. Anything could happen. There was an organisation called Pennies. It's down in um, Stranra. It was down in Stranra. Basically, they made um, fish fillets and tins of things and basically anything to do with seafood, they did it. You went into Marks and Spencer's and bought a, a jar of crab meat. It came from Pennies. And there was so much work coming from Marks and Spencer's that Pennies, in essence, became a single supplier. They didn't have any more customers because everything that they could make was being taken by Marks and Spencer's. Their factory was working at full speed. There was no space to expand or anything, so they just they worked what they could, sold everything to Marks and Spencer's. Life was good. It was right. It was good right up until the point that Marks and Spencer said, um, nah, it's too expensive. Here's our new deal. And our new deal is we'll pay you 25% less for everything than we have been up until now. As you can imagine, a quarter of your income being cut is tough. If they had a broader base, if they were selling to lots of different organisations, it may not have mattered so much, but they were selling solely to Marks and Spencers. And they simply couldn't take that cut. So they couldn't take the contract. They would just have lost money every day that were they were working. So they turned it down. Marks and Spencer said, well, that's all we'll be willing to pay. So the new contract wasn't signed and they closed the factory down because they had no other customers. That's a big issue. So having all your financial eggs in one basket is clearly a risk and not one that they addressed. It was all going well right up until the point that it wasn't. That's, um, do you think Marks and Spencers deliberately did that because they knew they had them cornered? Well, as far as I know, you can still buy jars of crab meat in Marks and Spencers. So yes, they clearly had other things in mind where they could get it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't doing it because they wanted to stop selling seafood. Well, it reminds me, I was watching, I, th I don't know if I mentioned it, it was an Amazon thing. And they became so powerful that I think they had some sort of dispute with booksellers. And so whenever the booksellers didn't want to take the new price, they basically just kind of like shut their pages down on Amazon or they'd redirect their traffic elsewhere. And they were basically just crippling every company that disagreed with them. Yeah. Um, so it's just, I don't know where that fits into like governance maybe. And, you know, these companies should be obviously no, no broken up, but they should be monitored better when they become too powerful. But I think Amazon and that are probably beyond that. It's also partly to do with legislation. In terms of book selling, there used to be something called the Net Book Price Agreement, something like that. In essence, all the booksellers agreed to sell all the books. You know, same book would sell at the same price. You couldn't discount books. Which was nice for those that were selling them, 
So if you happen to have a Waterstones in your town, you went to Waterstones, and if you happen to have a Borders in your town, you went to Borders, and the book, no matter what it was, was the same price, no matter where you went. So you just went to your local person, which was great for them. Not so good for you. If you were mm -hmm. buying a book at £10 that the bookseller was getting for £5. Um, and certainly if you're working online and you don't have a, a shop to look after and as many floor staff to look after, why can't you sell a book for six quid? That's partly how places like Amazon managed to become so big because the netbook agreement was struck down as illegal. It was called price fixing and they weren't allowed to do it, which is when books started appearing in, in supermarkets and things. And everyone thought, well, that's wonderful. Now we can sell books cheaply. But the other, well, what is the other side of that coin? Well, they force everybody else to it because they can sell them as cheaply. That's part of it. Anything else? Know. Which books do Tesco's want to sell? I don't know. Must have missed that. Well, are you likely to wander into Tesco's and see a sale on Italian Renaissance art from 1570 to 1760? No. Or are you likely to wander into Tesco's and see the latest Dan Brown piled up in huge stacks? That'll be, it'll be the popular choice, I suppose. So all of a sudden you're getting it cheaper, but only if you want what everyone else wants. Mm -hmm. So actually a lot of book publishers went out of business because what they would do is they would publish books which they hoped would sell. Nobody ever publishes a book they hope won't sell, but they would publish books that they believed in, hoped they would do well, and if they didn't, well, the money that they lost was replaced by the books that did sell. But if the books are selling are only selling at a discounted price, the money goes down, the amount you can spend to support writers and authors and all these other books goes away. You'll see the same kind of argument applied for uh, music. When people, I mean, I can remember what, 30 years ago, it would cost me £15 for a CD when they first came out. That was 30 years ago. Now I'd be amazed if I could find a CD, that a single CD that was as much as £15 30 years on. And I would be even more amazed if I actually bought one because they would tend to buy it from iTunes or Amazon or wherever else you would buy your digital music, if you buy it at all, or you don't just sign up to Spotify, which is wonderful for us, because I can pay a small amount and listen to pretty much anything I ever wanted to. But what if I didn't know that I wanted to listen to it? What if, um, as has happened, I've gone to see a band and they've had a couple of support acts and I thought, well, that's good. I better go buy the CD for the support act. And that money that I bought helps the support act, which helps them get bigger, which helps them become headlining acts, which helps them have supporting acts and so on and so on. But if all that's happening is nobody's going to see any music and you're getting Spotify for I don't know, what is Spotify? A couple of quid a week? Uh, I don't know. I, I've got iTunes. It's, it's a, a tenner, or something tenner like. I think now. I think they've upped, upped, upped it. <laughs> so we'll call it one CD. So instead of buying one CD every month, you buy all CDs every month. But the artist who would have got, I don't know, got a pound from a CD, suddenly gets 0 0.00017 pence when you listen to a song. And in the same way as you buy a Dan Brown, most people are listening to, 
I have no idea who people listen to because I hate current music. Who do people listen to? I don't know. I don't know. My music's old or obscure. Ming too. I'm still listening to White Ladder by David Gray. <laughs> Very popular in its time. It was one of the biggest selling CDs. Aye. Top five in the UK, I think. Still. Yeah. I've got the original print. I don't know where. I've got the original print. I bought it last year. <laughs> Um, but most people listen to the popular things so the unpopular things just get lost in the mix so it can be an issue this having a sole supplier becomes a problem if I asked you to go out and buy a book online and said you couldn't go to Amazon where are you going? Don't all rush at once. I don't know. I don't, is Waterstones actually shut down, like out of business? No, oh, it's was, still good. No, what was the other one? Was there one that went out of business you mentioned earlier? I don't know. Borders. Borders. Aye, I, I, I don't know. Borders are still in America. But I don't think I'll get any uh, here now anymore. I'd have probably went to Waterstones, maybe then. That's the one that would have popped in probably after Amazon. W. H. Smith. Is that even still open? Is that not shut down? <laughs> Probably. Everything's just shut down. I don't know what's there anymore. Get yourself a book and some stationery. I think I've actually Same been thing if I to buy a Mark. CD? Yes. Or a, and a wee electric toy car. No yep. control car. So, a sole supplier can be an issue because they suddenly have so much sway over what happens in the market that any change that they make can cause a change for everybody <clears throat> okay time's getting on um, so there are other risks there are reputational risks um, what happens if your organisation just gets a bad reputation it does something that they don't like what happens if you um what happens if your Google Mail goes down? Do people start looking for another supplier? What happens if Moodle goes down? Do you start looking for a different supplier? What happens if you can't get a, a, a delivery slot from Tesco's? Do you start looking at Sainsbury's? If your reputation goes, it can start to be a problem. Because if people don't like the reputation of the organisation, they're less likely to use that organisation. I think I mentioned before there was a, a charity whose uh, chief executive officer was making upwards of half a million pounds. I don't think that's acceptable for a charity and I don't donate to that charity anymore because I don't think that's reasonable. So if you lose your reputation, that kind of knock-on effects. People don't like you, they won't come to you, they won't pay for things, they won't donate. So you lose money, your staff become upset because they're involved in things. Um, what was the one in America? Um, there was a, a food company Donald Trump was pictured in the in the Oval Office with a whole pile of tins from a company. And all you saw online was never buying from this company again. And the other thing you saw on the on social media was staff saying, I'm so disappointed with my company. They were upset as well. And people won't join. That can happen in a wider scale. Trump won Florida. So how long before people think to themselves, if I'm going to Disney World, half of the people that I come into contact with are voting for Donald Trump. 
<laughs> or if you're on the other side of the fence, if I go to Disney World, half of the people hate Donald Trump. These things can make a difference. And once you lose your reputation, it's difficult to get back. It's why people have uh, fast response units now on social media. It used to be if you couldn't get a newspaper or the TV interested in something, it wouldn't happen. But of course, people can go onto social media and talk about things now. And that can be a big issue. And once you start to get that criticism, people see it and it becomes amplified and it extends and extends. What happens, for example, if you're a big supermarket and in attempting to squeeze one of your suppliers by cutting the cost of a contract, you force that supplier to go into administration and make 577 people redundant. Don't know if you've ever heard of Penny Seafood from Dumfries. No. It was an issue for Penny's, but it was also an issue for Marks and Spencer's. Because as soon as people realised what they were doing, when they realised about the predatory pricing from a company, and I mean, Marks and Spencer's you kind of think of as a kind of safe, middle of the road company. When they realise they're doing this kind of thing, making people redundant, you get a huge reputational risk and huge damage. So sometimes these things work both ways. So these are the kind of categories that you would might want to think about in terms of a risk register. Excuse me. And the things that you might want to think about when you're creating one for your case study. Questions. Uh, I can't think any just now. No. no. Okay. Um, the tutorial for this week is basically to continue that on. So to go to your case study, start to think about the risks, categorise them, rank them, assign costs. Now remember that's not just money. It could be time, it could be staff, it could be reputational. What are the costs? And how you're going to go about mitigating them. And I very clearly said the case study, which for some other classes has included their own organisation, not for you, because you guys are all doing the case study. Because I'll come back to what I said before. In fact, I'll not just come back to it, I'll bring up the I'll bring up the slide. No. It's the wrong slide. Yay. So remember what we talked about a month ago now? in terms of how we were going to evaluate this. You have a single report. You should be working on that by now. So it's based on the case study. And just to remind you what I'm looking for, I'm looking for an initial part to the report, so the report itself, if you like, which is the recommendations. What the organisation should do, what the issues are, what they should do about them. I'm also looking for a set of appendices, where if you say something like, there is a legislative issue here because, and, and you should do this, if anyone on the board of that company wants more information, they should be able to go to your appendix and find the answer in your appendix. So it should say what the issues are and give the background to that.
hopefully now that Moodle's up. Albeit very slowly, apparently. So we'll go back to the assessments section on middle. And I'll just remind you that there's a case study. So you should have read that. You should be familiar with it. If you have questions about the case study, if there's things that are in there that you're not sure about. There's a case study discussion forum. If you want to ask questions, put it in there. Actually, is it better to do it in teams now? Given that we all seem to live in teams these days. Either the case study forum or put it on Teams. Either way, I'm happy to answer the question. What I don't want is individual questions to the email. I want everybody to be able to see the answer. OK. OK. Mm -hmm. So your report must include, but is not restricted to. A governance framework. So we've talked about governance now. An identification of risks and a complete risk register and we've now finished the risk part. Legislative issues and suggested remedies, so any problems that there might be legally and what you do about them. And because of course. Your main background is IT, so I want you to think about IT, but I don't want you to just limit yourself to IT. So that's the report part, but there's also the appendices. So it's either one appendix or multiple appendices, and you might find it easier to do multiple appendices, one for each part. So an appendix for governance, an appendix for risk, an appendix for you know, whatever. So it sources and gives explanations for all your recommendations. So like I just said, if you've said that there's a GDPR issue and you need to do this for it, there should be something in the appendix that says the GDPR talks about this. It puts these things onto an organisation. We need to do this because. And don't forget you're working at master's level, so to keep the university happy, everything has to be referenced. So if you're talking about GDPR, you have to see where you've got that information so that somebody can go and take the next level and go back to that and find the issue at its source. So it might be a link to uh, government legislation or, or whatever, but it has to be properly referenced in the UWS style. For those of you that have been here before, the style has changed this year. Yeah. So just make sure that you're following the latest reference styles and I have put a link to it in there in there. Okay. You are also working at master's level. You are also asked to imagine yourself as being the GRC manager. So I'm not expecting to see a whole bunch of text chucked into Notepad++ plus plus, and you hope for the best. It needs to be a proper report and it needs to be properly laid out. If you're not, if that's not your 40, and that's fine, it's not everyone's 40, I've put up a link here. There's a designer. It used to be only in PowerPoint where you could make sort of fancy PowerPoint slides, but they've actually extended it to Word now. So your Office 365 
subscription via the university gives you access to this designer in Word. So as you're creating it, it'll analyze your document and say, you might want to look at this. So it's partly spell check, partly grammar, although you have that as well. But it's also about good layout, good headings, good whatever it happens to be. So if you're not as keen on that kind of thing, that shows you how it works and you can go and play with it. There's going to be quite a lot in here. Again, you, this is a master's course. So I'm expecting good depth in your replies. So if you've done a similar one, for example, last year, I expect it to be in more detail this year. Clearly, a lot of the stuff that you'll have from last year will be applicable. So go back to it, find it. But I'm expecting more depth, more detail, more understanding this year. So this isn't the sort of thing that you can dash off in five pages come January. I'm expecting a decent sized report that covers all of the issues. When, when is this due in? Sorry. Uh, January. Right. I don't think I've actually got a date on it yet, but basically the end of term, um, which is January. Did I put a date on it? I can't even remember. I, I don't that. think so. And in fact, I'm happy to. It's not that that on it. Yeah, I think I don't think I've even made it available yet to you. So I'm happy to talk to you about that. In terms of um, when you want that to be. So part of the reason I've given it out, and part of the reason I've kept banging on about do it as you're going along is that hopefully you won't get to the end of the term and have tons of stuff to do. I am fairly relaxed in terms of timing. What I would suggest is we say something like the first week after we come back in January, because what that does is it will pretty much be through all the material by the end of the year. I'm not expecting to have any extra material next year. So it gives you the chance to have worked on it as we're going through. It will then give you the Christmas break to work on the final report. And so the first week when we come back would seem to be about the right time. What do you reckon? Okay. I'm, go I'm going to try and have it done long before then anyway. So um, can, I, can I just ask something though, right? Because I've already kind of been trying to find you know good examples because it's kind of I, I mean I, I don't know some of the other guys have done this last year I, I didn't but there was like lots of companies out there with different sizes and there's going to be like GRC reports that have been done by about 20 people and and so I'm just getting a bit kind of panicky going it's master's level should I be producing that even though it's just me or I try to find the right balance with it you know with it I don't worry I want to do like enough and slightly more, but I don't want to do way too much either. If you know what I mean, I don't know where the limit is because I could keep going because I see things for like I read one for Airbus and I was like, is Tony expecting that? And I was I was like, I don't know what to do. Right, and so I know what needs to be in it because it's obviously right there. But in terms of the actual size, is there any kind of direction you can say, oh, this company, you might want to look at them? You know, and maybe they did a report or something like that. No, not to take it in fate, but just to get an idea of the, the size of the, a report that you want, because it could easily be a thousand pages or, you know, 40 pages. Well, it could, but clearly your case study company isn't as big as Airbus. Yeah. And it's actually not even as big as North Ayrshire Council, South Ayrshire Council, those other places where, for example, I was showing you the risk register. Mm -hmm. And that's their complete risk register. So I'm expecting you to think about the case study. I'm expecting there's issues in there, and I know there's issues in there because I wrote them in there deliberately. Mm -hmm. And you might even find think of things that I haven't been, but there are things that I have written in there that I expect you to cover, although there'll be other things that you'll come across too. In terms of length 
you've probably heard me say similar things before. I don't like to say this will be an X thousand word report because I don't like to limit somebody. I don't, like, I don't want somebody sitting there. I've seen it too often that people sit down and try and cut a two and a half thousand word report down to two thousand words mm -hmm. or try and pad out a thousand word report to two thousand. You're at a master's level. So I'm expecting you as part of this to actually make that decision for yourself. So when you're saying, well, how big or what's an appropriate level? Well, Airbus for 10 credit master's level is too much. Mm -hmm. But I'm expecting you to have addressed all the issues in the case study. And I'm expecting you to address all the issues that are on these sections from governance down to ripper. OK. If you've got a report, for example, to any kind of organisation that doesn't talk about GDPR, I have to ask why. In what world would a, a governance risk and compliance manager not talk about GDPR? Mm. Or legislative, any sort of legislative compliance. So these things in here, I expect to see in here. So we haven't got to IT specific frameworks, but I'll expect to see stuff about ITIL and I'll expect to see stuff about COBIT. So much so that I've actually identified those in terms of the marking scheme, which again, I haven't hidden. Governance, risk management, risk register, compliance and all the rest of the things. And you're right, you could go on forever. But that's why I've tried to not say um, go do a GRC report for Airbus because that's massive. Mm -hmm. I've said make a GRC report for this company, which I've given you some details on. So it's fairly contained. Um, and that sh if you've identified and addressed all the things in that case study, then you'll be fine. Using the headings as a guide. Has that helped at all? Yeah. yeah. Also, there's um there is uh, the uh, down below the additional material, the, the tutorial um, questions, the tutorial questions. Um, yes. Are, are they part of, uh, do they make part of the uh, um, assessment? So I think what I said before, so what you've got there is something like the risk quiz. So what I said before was they are not an assessment, so I'm not assessing these. I'm not even particularly going to look at them unless you want me to. And some people in the class have, and I've given them some feedback. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting to you is the kinds of questions I've posed in these tutorials mm -hmm. are the kinds of questions you should be posing yourself for your okay. case study. OK, because I was worried that, you know, um, I, it could be um, something you want us to complete and submit for your for grading and something like that. No, no, no. So it's it's not about me grading you. It's about trying to give you a pathway towards your final assessment. And that's right, part okay. of where those tutorial questions come in. Mm -hmm. If you can't look at the tutorial questions and go, oh, yeah, I know what we're talking about here. So this would be about this and that would be about that. Then mm -hmm. clearly you can't get that into your report. And yeah. the ones, the tutorial questions, I'm expecting to see you um, have thought about for your report. That may not be there's a specific section that talks about each of these questions. It yeah. just means that they are things that are in this. So this is the risk quiz. Okay. Eventually. So one of the common ways to manage risk is to accept it. Explain it, give an example. So and don't take this as gospel. I genuinely, it's been 
like two months since I read the case study and I've forgotten it. Um, but I, from memory, I kind of think there's risks for that company that they are accepting. Doesn't mean they haven't identified them and they haven't said why they're accepting them. But that might be something that works its way into your report. Why oh, is it so slow? So there's five types of organisational risk. So when you and your report to the board say, well, yeah. we're going to look at these kinds of risk. And they're going, well, well, why just those kinds of risk? You'll have something in your, in your appendix saying, well, there are five types of risk. There's this kind of risk and that kind of risk and that kind of risk. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of things we've looked at. So just it doesn't matter if we just review them and don't attempt, uh, attempt them or, you know, um, it's important that we attempt them to give us um, uh, a clear uh, guideline of what to expect or what to write about in our report. They are a guideline. What I'm okay. hoping you will do is if you have any issues with any of these questions, you'll bring them up with me. All right. So if there's any of these things that are confusing, anything that you don't actually know, how you would answer it. Mm -hmm. You'll get back to me. On Lovely. the other hand, mm -hmm. by creating answers to these, you will have created sections that hopefully, excuse me, you can take and rework into your report. Okay. So I've been saying to work on this as you go along. This is part of that. It's stuff that you can take and put in. So there's about avoiding risk. Again, the case study has things where you'll avoid risk. Mm. And if the board asks, what do you mean by avoiding risk? You've explained the approach mm. and given an example. Mm. And if the board say, well, why are we bothering doing a risk register? Well, you've got a question here that says, why are you bothering doing a risk register? And what might be in it and why? OK. So these are very much pointers for what I'm expecting to see in your final report, but using the case study as the as the, the surrounding framework for them. Okay. Anything else? No, I'm good, I think. I can feel myself getting further and further over as the sun's coming further and further in. Because if I go over here, it's just uh, ridiculous. OK. Uh, what uh, so tell me, uh, I, have, I have something. Maybe I said that and you didn't pick it. Because when I used to read the, the case study, there is something with the outside words. And I say, why you didn't add the thing about COVID in this lecture based on the case study it can be a risk too and how to mitigate it is that a so there are places where something like a pandemic are key to risk so if you're a government you should have a risk and you should have a plan to deal with it but in terms of my, I don't want to prescribe how you should be thinking about it, but my thoughts about it are probably um, that it could happen but it's probably not something you want to spend an awful lot of time thinking about. Now, I might be wrong in that, and that's partly why some people are, are quite slow at responding to a pandemic, but the chances of it actually happen, happening were low and stay low. So I think pandemic comes under acceptable risk. It's something that could happen, something you might want to put in there. But I, 
I know for a fact that for most organisations, a uh, deadly pandemic that makes everybody stay in their house for six months wasn't on them. And the same okay, way as getting hit by a meteor isn't on there. Of course it could happen, but there's not an awful lot you can do about it. And it's probably worth spending your time on other things than that. Does that make sense? Okay. It makes it make a lot of sense based on the money people lost on this pandemic because you say as a manager, we have to take in consideration this situation. Does it going to affect the management based on the financial side? If you have to do, I just want, I don't want to remember the last one, last year one, but I'm talking about the how to make people be interesting about our products when there is this pandemic. If I need to write it on my report, because is the is my question this. Yeah, so for this organization, for this case study, I don't think it's top of the list. If you're a hospital, if you're a government, yeah. So if the case study had been your hospital, what's the risk? And the risk is your flooded with patients and you've nowhere to put them and you've got no uh, protective equipment. Yeah, that's a risk for a hospital. For this particular case study, um, as I say, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's one that would, despite it being a massive effect, I don't think it's something that particularly belongs in great deal on a risk register because there's so little you can do about it. It's a, yes, it might happen, but the only way that I can mitigate that for my organisation is to create a vaccine. I can't do that. Therefore, yep, it could happen, but we'll just have to live with it and hope for the best. So it's, it's a fingers crossed one. See if you really wanted to mention it. Could you not just stick it? See if you're doing this. Could you not just stick it in like your? There'll surely be a bit about disaster recovery, or something like that. So like if you know you had a site that had to shut down for other reasons, do you have mm -hmm. the facilities to work from home? Have you got enough laptops? Have you got enough? You know, what is it called? Is it a cold site? Is it a different site where you can go and? Because that that's you being prepared and you could use that in a pandemic but it's not necessarily for the pandemic. Well, actually, you can use it in a pandemic because if you had that, you're still taking the same people and putting them in the same place where they're not allowed to be. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying about right laptops in terms and of stuff. That about, kind of, sorry? That's what, I was, that's what I mentioned, laptops and stuff, and uh, workers being able to work kind of uh, more mobile. But, yeah, obviously moving from one building to another is not really going to mitigate it, but working from home, if you had laptops and the ability to just kind of up sticks and go home and do a bit of work, then that so I'm, I'm kind of half and half with both you and bonnie so it's yes what happens if maybe instead of maybe as a long-term plan instead of putting pcs on people's desks we put laptops on people's desks so if something like this happens they can just get up and go mm -hmm. no but it's just because they were in this uh, when i was writing and reading this, I say something about warehouse, and I know that there is many people inside the warehouse working. It's for this I went on what the pandemic gave us as a prescription or restriction to do. I understand your what you said, and I will work how I understand the topic. As I say, I, your choice might be different from mine. I put it under acceptable risk. And by acceptable risk, we don't mean something that we're happy with. We just mean something we have to live with. Mm -hmm. So well, I, I had no plans to mention it, and I don't think it's going to get any extra special marks if you mention it just because it's happening now. So I don't know. I, in terms of the report, it won't be in my report, maybe if like, if I'm talking about like about a disaster recovery and mitigating things like the you know the the factory or one of the places not being available, but that's probably about it. 
I would be happier if you started thinking about floods or power supplies or you know that yeah. kind of thing. Um, yes, of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Of course, it has caused big issues for pretty much every organisation. But it has literally never happened before. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say it won't happen again. It might actually be something that we need to think about as being a more um, regular risk. But right at the moment, I don't think I would spend too much brain power on it. So if you've got it in there, Bonnie, fine. But it's, it's, not, it's not top of my list. Any Thank other you. questions? <coughs> no, I'm all good. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording in case there's anybody that has a question but doesn't want to be recorded. At least I would do if I hadn't, if I didn't seem to be frozen. I see my video is gone. Is the sound going as well? Was it just a video? Uh, no, we can hear you. I'll be back in a wee second anyway. Well, Brian, actually, all I was going to say was um, it's five to one. So I think we're done for the day anyway. So unless you're hanging about to ask a specific question out of the recording, Thank you, and I will see you next week. No, I'm I'm good. I just need to go back to my work, but I'll uh, speak to you later. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, Thank you. Man, I can't even get the stop recording button to appear. Just a quick one. Um, this company, which is in the case study, does it exist? No. It doesn't exist. So we are just using it um, just for our um, course assessment. There are elements in there of companies that I've worked for or worked with. Mm -hmm. um, there are sort of vague things that I have been involved in, but no, I. I I took bits from here and there, but it's not it's not a real place, no. All right, okay. So there isn't there isn't an answer if that's what you're asking. No, <laughs> no I just wanted to know if uh, it does exist, okay? Because I could, uh, I I tried to go on Google to find it, and there's a lot of AGP companies. <laughs> so I thought that it exists. So but, nah. yeah, it's not a problem. <laughs> nope. Okay. Just a figment. All right. Have a lovely weekend and we'll catch you next week. You uh, too. I'm off to work again. <laughs> All right. Enjoy. Cheers. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Cheers for today, Tony. Appreciate it. Sorry, did somebody say something there? Yeah, I was just saying cheers. For All the right, day. sorry. Thank you. It's actually a good lesson, so thank you. Okay, thank you too. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank thing. you all for coming. Right. Oh, Bye. finally got a meeting. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. See you later. This is trying to stop recording now, I think. Albeit slowly.
Anybody still there? My teams is just completely died. I think.